the path to climate neutrality by 2050, the coming decade plays a crucial role. There is a need to undertake decisive steps towards decarbonisation and significantly accelerate the energy transition politically, economically and socially in the coming decade. This includes the effective and widespread implementation of renewable energy technologies in all end users, including green hydrogen, but also the implementation of frameworks for green investments, activities, and the inclusion of the civil society for the energy vendor. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. And we want to continue now with a deeper dive. As we heard from several of our opening session speakers, as well as in the film, the next nine years of this decade will be absolutely critical. Global greenhouse gas emissions need to fall by 7.6% each year if the world is serious about limiting temperature rises to close to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And that is only possible through urgent, transformative action to boost innovative technologies across the renewable energy spectrum, including green hydrogen, which we heard quite a bit about just now in our opening session, as well as new measures to unlock green investments and to leverage participation by citizens and civil society. The decisions we make now will determine what world our children live in. Can we make this the green decade and get on the right road by 2030? That is the topic of our high-ranking panel discussion. And before I introduce our speakers, I would like to pose a, uh, an audience question, and I see that many of you are already at work answering it, but I'm gonna give you a little bit more time to do so. Our question is this, in your opinion, will the world be on an emission reduction trajectory by 2030? And uh, keep on voting on that if you would. You can use the Slido function that you see on your live stream window if you are a registered uh, user here at the BETD. And we will unveil the results of that poll in just a minute after I introduce our speakers. And ladies and gentlemen, I am going to keep our intros very brief here and throughout the conference in order to maximize our time to talk because all of our panels are pretty compact time-wise. And I would also just like to give a hint to our speakers. We'd be very grateful if you would do the same, especially in this virtual format. Timekeeping is of the absolute essence. So I'm going to ask you to please keep your answers to three minutes maximum in our first round of questions and possibly, if, if possible, even shorter after that. So with that, I will now begin introducing Patricia Espinoza is the indefatigable executive <laughs> secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Lovely to see you again, Patricia Espinoza. Leonora Gewessler is Austria's Federal Minister for Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation, and Technology. Welcome to you. Great that you can join us. It's also great to have with us Abdulaziz bin Salman. He is Minister of Energy for Saudi Arabia. Alok Kumar is with us, joining from India. He is State Secretary in India's Minister of Power. Thank you so much for joining us uh, at rather short notice, uh, dear State Secretary. And I am so pleased to welcome Shan King Lin. He is the Vice Minister of China's National Energy Administration. Great to have you with us as well, sir. So let us now take a quick look at the results of that audience survey before we pose a question to our panel. Okay, and we see that there's a slight uh, larger share for the optimists here, 36% saying yes, 32% no, and the maybes are tied with the no votes. So all in all, um, Many people either skeptical or think, in fact, we are not on track. Now, let me pose one question for all of our panelists, and then I'm just going to go straight 
down the panel. And the question is this, given the importance of this current decade that we're in, I'd like to begin by getting your take on what are the very most urgent steps that need to be taken in the energy sector prior to 2030. What has to be done if we are serious about being on the yes side of that question? Patricia? Thank you, Melinda. Thank you for this opportunity uh, to participate in this very important conversation. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that yes, it's going to be very difficult, but we have an unprecedented opportunity. We have an unprecedented opportunity because uh, we can use the global economic response to COVID in order to build forward resilient, sustainable economies for a cleaner, greener, and healthier future. We know that by now, the economic response to COVID is upwards of 15 trillion and counting. So uh, my message is spend it correctly to get the climate resilient pathways that the Paris Agreement outlines the importance, the urgency, and the financial case for a green transformation in all sectors is outlined in the agreement. In my view, there are three important steps for state and non-state actors on the road to 2030. First, as I said, align recovery plans with the Paris Agreement. And this is a way to deal with the two crises at once. The pandemic didn't stop the existential climate change emergency, but the recovery can help address it. Second, implement the Paris Agreement. Five years after the agreement was adopted, negotiations for its full implementation are still not complete, and this must be achieved at COP26. Fulfill previous promises especially commitments to support developing countries, including the mobilization of 100 billion. And this is important because we are seeing all these very ambitious plans like the Green uh, Deal from the European Union. Well, if we do not make what is necessary to support the efforts in developing countries, in the countries that have less means to do the transformation, all the efforts that are going to be made in the most advanced economies will be undermined. So it is very important that we also see that the support for the transformation to happen everywhere in the world is really an essential part of the, of the package of actions and decisions we need to make. We are hearing a lot about the 2030 and the 2050 goals, but commitments due by 2020 have not been fulfilled yet. And this is basically about support to developing countries. We need to build trust. So we need to build trust that what we will do multilaterally and committing to new goals uh, will be fulfilled. And for that, we need to fulfill the goals and commitments that were made before. The NDCs are a very important example. Nations were supposed to submit their updated national climate action plans by the end of last year. More than half did not. And it is true, the pandemic did affect the functioning in many countries, but in others, it was just not a priority. So the third point is that we need to see all NDCs by COP26. The recent NDC synthesis report shows that we are still very, very far from achieving the 1.5 degree goal. NDCs, especially by major emitters, need to be as ambitious and as possible. These plans are only submitted once every five years. So by 2025, the window of opportunity will likely be closed. We are making progress, it's true, but not fast enough. And we need to be very conscious about that. So 2021 is key. And you are right, this decade is key. 2021 is key because this is the moment where we need to take the decisions. We need to align the recovery efforts with Paris. We need to fulfill past promises and complete the negotiations. And we need to submit all remaining NDCs this year. Over to you, Melinda.
Thank you so much, uh, Patricia Espinoza from the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Let me pose the same question now uh, to uh, the rest of our panel, Minister Gewessler. Most crucial steps if we are serious about reaching these goals by 2030. Well, thanks a lot, dear excellencies, dear colleagues. I think um, this is a very timely debate because it's a decisive decade. We are indeed the last generation of politicians who can deliver on the promise of Paris. And I think it's our duty not to fail future generations. And it's a decisive year, year 2021. As Patricia Espinosa outlined, the way we act now at the crossroads of these two crises that we face, the COVID crisis and the climate crisis, will decide on our pathway to a greener, a better, a more resilient future. So decisive decade, decisive year, and to deliver on what's our task and to deliver on what's the promise of the Paris Agreement, especially in the energy sector, we have two absolutely no regret options. We need to invest heavily and advance in energy efficiency, and we need to move forward in replacing fossil fuels and nuclear energy by renewables. That's two absolutely no regret options that we have at our hand and that we need to deliver on in 2021 onwards. What we do in Austria is that we uh, just recently decided on our new renewables law, which will deliver on the renewable side our goal is to have 100% renewable electricity by 2030. So that means adding 50% of renewables capacity in just nine years. Big task, needs a stable, good political framework. And we also work on the efficiency side with a special focus on transport and buildings because these are two key sectors in this respect with a big renovation wave and um, with our focus on transforming the transport and mobility sector towards focus on uh, also um, efficiency and renewables. But this needs to be embedded in, I think, two major processes that, um, that we face. The one thing is that it needs European uh, and global coordination. On the European level, uh, I think it's crucial with keep path on the Green Deal, that we not only deliver on an ambitious climate law, but that the Fit for 55 package delivers on the ambition of the Green Deal. And the second thing we need to be very clear, energy transition will only be a successful exercise if we have our societies on board. And this means dialogue, this means just transition, and this means most of all making our citizens, making our people actors in the energy transition. And uh, this is um, just four points that I think we need to focus on, especially in 2021. Thank you very much uh, also for that emphasis on public uh, discourse and acceptance. Let me move on now to Minister Bin Salman. Same question to you. Most crucial steps that you're taking that need to be taken. Well, um, I couldn't find a better word than the last word that uh, Her Excellency, the Commission President, uh, did mention about working together. I think we, as Saudi Arabia, have always demonstrated, and uh, last of which was the last uh, G20 last year, we worked together with all G20 countries to ensure that we have a good uh, material with, with regard to the conclusion of our activities with the G20 on, on the uh, statement that was issued. There are quite a few things that talks and does address many of these topical issues that are of concern to the whole world. Uh, to name few, circular carbon economy was, uh, was uh, proved to be a, a good way forward. Uh, we want to make sure that also as a, a, a reliable long-term hydrocarbon producer uh, would not be shy uh, in being part of the solution. In fact, uh, I took it upon myself, the Saudi government took it upon itself that we should not just strive to, to be part of the solution, but actually be leading some solutions and serious solutions to, to, to help us mitigate the concerns that uh, the whole world is faced with, with regard to climate change and what have you. That's why we want to also be an exemplary to many of the hydrocarbon producers in how we conduct ourselves to assure the world that uh, we are pioneering solutions. Obviously, 
we would require and need the support and uh, collaboration of so many. Uh, we uh, find uh, technological uh, and technology and innovations is is the right path. Uh, while we are also taking upon us the challenge of uh, uh, um, conducting some uh, of these solutions as pioneers, for example. Uh, we are introducing uh, green hydrogen in a huge scale in New York. Uh, we are converting uh, our power uh, sector consumption to towards 50% of renewable and 50% of gas. Even with gas, we are ensuring that that gas production, and we still have a good record, if not the best record in planet Earth on, on emissions on ups, all of our upstream activities. Uh, the liquid displacement program that we will be uh, inducing uh, this year will take care of reducing our uh, uh, petroleum and petroleum product consumption in, in, in all utilities by about a million barrel, with a huge amount of saving in, when it comes to emissions. Uh, we, we are involved in so many international activities. Just to name a few, Mission Innovation, Clean Energy Ministerial, Carbon Sequesterization, Sequesterization Leadership Forum. We even worked with our colleagues in the G20 to create a platform for CCE. Uh, I think uh, the Commission and everybody need to be innovative in how to be creative in being inclusive, uh, mindful of uh, uh, national uh, uh, um, um, situations of each of these so-called, I would call it, serious uh, participants. I think, uh, I hope that we have not, uh, that uh, we undoubtedly have shown and demonstrated our seriousness and uh, our ability to work with others. Uh, I, I believe that uh, in our NDCs, uh, we have submitted them in 2015, it says a lot. Uh, when we submit, because we are only required to submit our new NDC on 2025, as our colleague was saying, you will see more, uh, and we will see it more willingly and voluntary, because we honestly believe that there is a lot to contribute with and a lot to benefit from. If we are to maintain ourselves as a long-term hydrocarbon producer, well, we have to be uh, uh, innovative enough and collaborative enough to ensure that these hydrocarbon resources would be monetized and used uh, in a better way. That's why we are also launching a big program, which we call it actually sustainability program, which is to try to find ways and means of using these hydrocarbons in different ways, especially in terms of material, which would not be in any way impacting or effectively affecting the environment in any uh, way uh, uh, at all. So uh, even we are building a case that even if with the conventional market may shrink in terms of size, we will have our abilities to improve our lot with monetizing and exploiting our uh, natural resources in a certainly in a better way, in a more effective way, more efficient way, and certainly uh, more commensurate with the prerequisite of maintaining and preserving the climate. Uh, we are uh, demonstrating and we're willing to be this demonstrating and we'll showcase what we have been doing and what we will be doing uh, 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 hopefully the end of this year in COP26. Uh, we will demonstrate to the whole world that we are scoring and scoring well when it comes to the four R's of the circular carbon economy. We will demonstrate to the whole world how much. We'll just demonstrate how much we're doing, we'll be doing on the, uh, the reduce in terms of efficiency and, 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 uh, and, and, and changing our renewable to renewable in terms of recycling, reusing. And as was uh, our friend from the EU Commission president was mentioning, which is how to preserve things and how to be even as Saudi Arabia be part of that endeavor to ensure that things will be protected. In fact, things should be enlarged and enhanced. Thank you.
Minister, thank you very much. And let me move uh, now to State Secretary Kumar from India. And India, of course, has been making impressive progress on the renewables front. So in view of the time, I'm going to ask you to also say a few words about the most crucial next steps to meet your renewable energy targets and what targets you will be aiming for now in the coming nine years. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellencies and my colleagues. It is a great pleasure for me to, uh, to speak at this forum about how we are doing, uh, taking forward our energy transition. I also convey best wishes from the side of my minister, Mr. Arke Singh, who could not attend this, uh, this uh, uh, meet. Reducing the growth of greenhouse gas emissions has been the foremost challenge for mankind and for us also. Our Honorable Prime Minister's vision for the country and the actions undertaken are planned as a commitment to leave a better world for our generations. Our key focus is on implementing renewable energy expansion, which envisages a five-fold increase in the overall capacity from 32 gigawatt in year 2014 to 175 gigawatt by year 2022 including 100 gigawatt of solar and 60 gigawatt of wind. We are also further committed to achieve 450 gigawatt of renewable energy by year 2030. Renewable energy expansion brings challenges of balancing power. In addition to the conventional balancing power like pumped hydro storage projects, India is looking very seriously and working very seriously on green hydrogen. Our recent budget has announced a green hydrogen mission. And we are going to take up and launch very soon, very ambitious uh, first project for promoting green uh, hydrogen. And also, we are contemplating some obligations on our other industries to have green hydrogen obligations. Another important area is promoting electric vehicles uh, to, uh, to achieve the goal of zero emission and security and energy efficiency. And Ministry of Power is working very hard for rolling out the charging infrastructure for promoting the electric mobility. The focus of the Indian power sector has now shifted to having a safer environment along with sustainable power generation. Several initiatives have been taken to improve the efficiency of coal-based power plants. We are also retiring the old inefficient plants, uh, about 228 units of around 16 gigawatt have already been retired in the last few years. Going further, we are working on ultra-supercritical technology and advanced ultra-supercritical technology for our thermal power generation units. We have also decided that uh, go, uh, from year 2017, all the units have to be mandatorily of supercritical technology so as to be the best in the emissions. Uh, we are also in the process of making our coal-based capacity environment friendly by installing the flue gas desulfurization plants and ESPs in all our capacity in the next few years. India today is the third largest solar market in the world. India is also undertaking a number of energy efficiency initiatives and I am very happy to share with you that as a result of these initiatives, we have achieved close to 200 million tons of emissions saving yearly in year 1920 and as per our estimate we are going to touch now 300 million tons of carbon uh, oxide carbon dioxide emissions yearly this is a really uh, we feel is a very <clears throat> impressive achievement and we are fully committed to achieve our ndcs india already has a net per capita emission rate which is much less than the world average even then, India has also achieved a reduction of 24% in emission intensity of our GDP between year 2005 and 2016, thereby achieving its pre-2020 voluntary target. India has already embarked on a roadmap with demonstrated significant progress for achieving the nationally determined contributions and is well on, on its way to achieve its future emission reduction goals. I am very proud to say that amongst the largest, large, uh, larger economies in the world, perhaps India is the only large economy which is on track to achieve its NDCs and even I feel we will overachieve. Lastly, I would like to emphasize on the sustainable use of resources for a 
holistic and healthy lifestyle that keeps the carbon footprint at the individual level low. We need to deal with Mother Earth with a spirit of trusteeship. Thank you. Thank you very much, State Secretary Kumar. And we come now to China and Vice Minister Lin. And uh, M Mr. Lin, it has been mentioned several times already at the conference, the fact that President Xi made a pledge last September to decarbonize China before 2060. Last week, you published the 14th five-year plan with a longer-term vision until 2035. What specific steps are you taking right now and in the course of the next few years to put China on that path to achieving the bigger goal of carbon neutral neutrality before 2060? Moderator, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be able to join you at the 7th Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue and at the UN General Assembly last year, we did indeed announce our emission targets, which we intend to lead to uh, carbon neutrality, and we have taken some measures, specific measures. For example, we need clean energy, we need efficient energy. In particular, we need to reduce our energy consumption. We need to actively increase the amount of renewable energy, and we also need to increase the num amount of clean renewable energy, such as uh, hydropower, and we need to develop energy storage technologies. We need a smart electricity transmission and distribution systems, and we need to ensure that renewable energy and new forms of energy become the main pillar of our energy mix. In the industrial sector, in particular, China has already shown the way forward that we are able to attain the standards that we've set ourselves. For example, we're trying to ensure that this happens in road traffic. We want a moderate use of energy and raw materials input in road traffic, and we want to have to attain a green lifestyle. And this is particularly true of the question of how we can replace traditional sources of energy with electrical energy. How can we cut China's per capita energy consumption? Or how can we cut it in terms of GDP? And then the third question, is how, when we build up new clean energy infrastructure, how can we create great breakthroughs? How can we have an economy with, how can we reach a low carbon economy? How can we use new materials? How can we use new materials to uh, help us save energy? How can we ensure that the progress of science and technology makes that possible for us? And then we can also think about what measures we need to take in order to have a holistic, low-carbon lifestyle in all our society. And in particular, what we call a green lifestyle is something we are pursuing, and we, the Chinese government is really working very hard on these goals, and we are sure that we can rely on the support of our entire population as we pursue our ambitious targets for 2030 and for 2060, and we're looking forward to intensified cooperation with all of you, and we're looking forward to working with you to help so solve the world's climate problems. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Vice Minister Lin. And with an eye on the clock, uh, dear speakers, I am going to move us on to our closing round of discussion. I'm very sorry, but unfortunately, as I said, we have a very compact uh, time frame today. So let me ask all of you to speak to this. What are the biggest challenges you see on that road to 2030, on that road to uh, decarbonization and climate neutrality? And how can international cooperation help to meet those challenges? All of you are involved in various forms of international partnership. I'd like to, you to speak, please, specifically to that point, because it has been emphasized here several times today. This will only work if it is an international concerted action. Patricia Espinoza also told us at the beginning of this discussion, it's all about cooperation, especially with developing and emerging economies. So let me go straight down the panel. Biggest challenge and how cooperation can help to meet it. And dear speakers, we really have just a maximum of about eight or nine minutes for this. So please keep your answers very concise if you would. Thank you so much. Patricia Espinoza, get us started, please. Yes, Melinda, uh, cooperation is absolutely crucial because the climate emergency is a global existential threat to humanity that recognizes no boundaries. So multilateralism is the only way to address it. And cooperation, by the way, we need it not only internationally, we need it also across all jurisdictions, across ministries within governments and aligned with the private sector in the energy sector that has such an important role to achieve the goals by the Paris Agreement, we need cooperation to get there. We must substantially reduce fossil fuel use. We must switch to low carbon energy carriers. We must invest in low carbon energy and we need to use our current energy more efficiently. That's a lot, a lot, a big agenda. But the good news, as we have heard from speakers today, is that there have been rapid improvements in the technology and there has been an embrace of that technology like we have seen with wind and solar energy. And we know we are seeing that there are important investments in new technologies like uh, green um, hydrogen. So um, we really have a long way to go. Uh, Secretary General Guterres has uh, put forward uh, some points in order to get there. Uh, he has uh, called on countries to embrace these low and zero carbon electricity sources to halting the construction of new coal-fired power plants and retiring the existing coal-fired power plants. He has called on limiting the construction of new gas-fired power plants and uh, as well to replace cars that use gasoline with those using electricity, which is something that is starting to happen, but still we need to accelerate that. Uh, so this transition is not only about the technologies, it requires changes at national levels. It requires uh, really um, a, a lot of um, a policy, the right policies, the right legal frameworks, and, and that is uh, very important. And this is also one area where NDCs can make a good contribution because in those plans, governments can set those policies can set carbon pricing, can set as a, a very specific goals in phasing out fossil fuel subsidies, can reduce fossil fuel demand. So the transition must also be done in a just way. So the plans that we need, need to work for all. We need, we should not leave anyone behind. And it has to be fair for all. So it's a very, very challenging agenda. But I am sure that with international cooperation, we can make it. We need the support of the financial community to also align with the Paris Agreement. Investors need to invest in this uh, new, better future. And we need everyone else on board. Um, from companies to cities to civil society and individuals to accelerate what we are already seeing, but not yet at the level that is required. 
Over to you, Melinda. Thank you so much, Patricia. And we're going to be picking up on a number of those themes, including the role of cities, including the role of local government in uh, subsequent sessions here at the BETD. Minister Gewessler, um, Patricia just mentioned coal. Austria is already out of coal. You also have set yourselves a very challenging renewables target, 100% by 2030. So maybe you can speak very briefly, if you would, to where cooperation can help you get there. I, if we are facing a, a global emergency with the climate crisis and where um, that needs, as Patricia has been also said, everybody on board. We need to uh, deliver nationally. So that's uh, why we work very hard on building all the cornerstones for the energy transition that we need. But we also need to, uh, to do that and to get uh, the, um, the support in international fora and in the, in the region, because I think m many of the solutions, by definition, will be regional, will be European, um, will be even global. Hydrogen is, uh, is just green hydrogen is just one example. But cooperation, I think, and this is what, what needs to guide us in this, uh, needs to be a tool to deliver towards our goals, to be true to the Paris Agreement, to give an answer to future generations on the biggest crisis humanity faces with the climate crisis. So um, if you asked in your first question, what would be the biggest challenges I see on this way? Because without a doubt, this is a big, this is a project that means we are navigating big changes. Then I think it's the, <clears throat> the challenge of uh, delivering on the pace and the urgency we need in this transition and um, the, uh, the, the fact that we cannot leave anybody behind in this endeavor. Mm -hmm. So we need bold and courageous policies at this point in time to uh, build a, a better and a greener and a more resilient future. And in the energy system, this means big changes. But the best way to predict the future of the energy system right now is to shape it. And I think this is our task as politicians nationally, in European and in global cooperation. Thank you very much, Minister Gewessler. I'll go now to State Secretary Kumar again. Request for a very brief answer, please. <clears throat> yeah, I think there are two important, the most important challenges are first the making technology cheaper as fast as possible because we are in the process of now enhancing the share of renewable energy but that to happen beyond a point requires balancing and storage power sources which currently are say like battery or with green hydrogen but the cost of these technologies it, uh, it needs to be brought down uh, to make it affordable and feasible uh, very quickly so we need a uh, lot of international cooperation uh, to work on these two uh, these uh, two technologies. Maybe some more technology will come up. Other important part is cooperation. Like in India, I'll give you an example. For uh, promoting renewable energy, every state of India, every province of India was working separately. And there were huge issues of diversity and variability. Now we, are, we have been, uh, been successful in integrating the renewable energy at national level. So all the renewable energy is being fed to national grid. So we are uh, now reaping the benefit of diversity and also better stability. Going forward, uh, our Honorable Prime Minister has given a call for a new initiative, which is called One Sun, One World, One Grid. That to mean that let us integrate our electricity grids, grow, uh, uh, grow it uh, say, as fast as possible so that we can reap the benefit of difference of time zones and also diversities to make solar energy even more viable. Uh, third point is also the market integration of the green energy. India has been successfully, uh, 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 India has successfully integrated the green energy in our power exchanges. We have already a green uh, term ahead market, green day ahead market is on the annual. These are the few uh, challenges they to namely the, the technology development, the regional cooperation, 
and market integration of renewable energy. Thank you very much. Thank you, State Secretary. And I'll just uh, remind everybody that that alliance that you just mentioned, One Sun, One World, One Grid, will actually connect 140 different countries through a common grid to transfer solar power when it is realized. So over to, to Minister Bin Salman now, please, if you would, again, a very brief answer. We are unfortunately almost at the end of our time. Thank you. I, I know, but uh, I will keep, keep it simple and short. Uh, I think first of all, you've asked the question what to do. Uh, very simple. We've, we've gone beyond negotiation. We are now in a phase of delivering uh, what we have negotiated. We wholeheartedly, as Saudi Arabia, believe in Paris Agreement, and we are willing, uh, willingly executing what we have agreed to uh, in Paris Agreement. And everybody who signed that agreement should be willingly uh, uh, committed to, to uh, to executing it. So we've gone, I think we've gone beyond the negotiation towards uh, uh, the um, application of what we've agreed to. If we are to uh, conduct ourselves to, uh, to, to, con to uh, executing the, what we've agreed to, I think we should make ourselves more available to the terms and condition of that agreement, which is, it is an agreement to attend to all emissions at all sectors, uh, and that we have to have that scope and large enough to take into the spirit and the details of that agreement. Three, we have to uh, be mindful of national circumstances, whereby if you want a holistic solution, a collaborative solution, where as uh, some of our colleagues here did mention that it should involve and include everybody, if you want to be inclusive, you have to be mindful of the circumstances of each and all those who you want them to participate with you. And again, we have to make sure that technologies and innovation are available to all, and to ensure that uh, the application of these technologies will not be given to the few and kept away from the the, the most needed needy uh, participant. We have, for example, uh, I, I, you know, for the purpose of time, I, I would Minister, refrain Minister, from I'm afraid I'm going to have to stop you oh. there because uh, we are just about out of time, and I do want to also uh, sure. move to you our understand. last speaker. So thank you very much for that. Vice Minister Lin, your thoughts, please. Biggest challenge and how cooperation can help. In one minute, if you'd be so kind. Well, thank you very much. I shall really try to stick to one minute. The first question was, what's the biggest challenge for China, particularly that refers to the optimization of the energy structures? And the second question was, where does China see itself? And we, of course, try across all levels. To modernize the energy sector, we try, in particular, to progress clean energy. We try to cover our peak loads better. And in particular, we tried, we're trying to strike a better balance between base load and peak load. And we want to ensure that we can uh, cut the amount of coal fired power generation were from, down from 70% to less than 60% in terms of coal-fired power generation, and the, gener the development of renewables is also an important issue. And we've already got more than 100 gigawatts or 190 gigawatts of installed capacity in the fields of renewables. And when you look at what economic growth China is still achieving, then the security and the reliability of the electricity supply and the distribution and transmission grids is a very important issue for us. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't uh, exceed my time. Thank you very much to the moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Minister. And to all of our speakers, I greatly appreciate your participation in our panel. You've given us important impulses for our further discussions. Our very nice uh, Minister Gvesla is back uh, for, for me to be able to say goodbye to you as well, Madam. Uh, I appreciate your participation, and uh, thank you, and goodbye.